A very good morning and welcome to Media Monitor, the show that monitors and evaluates media coverage of leading stories of the week and puts the media in the spotlight. I'm your host, Alicia Jali. We're live right here on the SABC News on Channel 404. In our lineup today, we start by discussing today's newspaper headlines and look at the recent spark in hijackings, the Marikana Commission of Inquiry, as well as the Numsa wage strike. We analyze the ongoing Gaza conflict and the missing Algerian airline with the Ukrainian MH17 airstrike aftermath the Boko Haram saga, as well as the Commonwealth Games. Now to analyze media coverage of these stories, let's welcome Mr. Jacob Mjogoro, a media studies lecturer at Damelin College, Mr. Noah Marutule, a director at Kaliofa's Africa Foundation, and of course, SABC journalist Nozim Dombimi. And on the line, we will also be joined by Mr. Gareth Newham. He's the head of governance, crime and justice at the Institute for Security Studies. And remember, you can call us to give us insight on the stories that you think deserve to be covered by the media but we're omitted on the following numbers plus 2711 714 6847 714 6843 and 714 6857 you can share your views and comments on twitter at sa media monitor as well as on facebook our facebook page is media monitor very good morning to you All right, now as tradition, before we go into discussions with the stories that made headlines throughout the week, let's take a look at today's newspaper headlines panel. A very good morning to you and thank you so much for joining us right here on Media Monitor. Your pick, Jacob, let's start with you. What's enticing you on today's newspaper headlines and why? Um, I'm, I'm interested in this story in the city press today, talking about the cabinet and how many cabinet ministers have not yet declared uh, a possible conflict of interest in their companies that they own mm -hmm. before they were nominated to cabinet. But I'm wondering if the city press is jumping the gun because it also says they're supposed to do that by the 15th of August. Mm. So I'm wondering if there's a story already or this story is not a story yet. Still but it's, it's, it's under. going to be an interesting one if, if there is a conflict of interest as of yet. And obviously the Soweto derby that was there yesterday uh, arounding this coming of the soccer season and many men out there will be very happy to see <laughs> the soccer season coming back. <laughs> <laughs> We've just had the World Cup. I yeah, mean, yeah. really. <laughs> no, what, what tickles your fans on today's newspaper headlines? Uh, Sunday Times, uh, little Tigrin's horrific journey mm. to death. You know, this tells uh, a story of the horrible society that we live in. Um, you know, it, it, it takes or it took us such a happening for there to be a national outcry. You know, these are things that happen every day. And, and um, for a four-year-old to be dragged in a, on a car or an on a car seat belt for three kilometers, okay, some papers tell, tell us about four kilometers, others contradiction, others are saying eight kilometers. The story is actually a bit confusing. But at the end of the day, this is a real horrible kind of society that we live in. Something really needs to be done. But the question is what? and by who? No, mm, mm, mm. Well, I'm having a look at the Sunday Independent and we're looking at the issue of retail giants being dragged into the Gaza conflict. Well, I think, you know, the Gaza issue is, is a very sensitive issue. Yes. And especially as South Africa, who's just come from a back date that's been compared to the Gaza issue, I do think that our government needs to be very sensitive to other countries that are going through a situation that is perceived to be almost like the apartheid issue. And I do think that where there is any form of injustice, we should step up as a country and say, no, we're not going to stand for injustice. We are not going to step aside and allow the West or allow other countries that possibly want to have a, a say in the issue or want to have their word uh, uh, you know, held over above the rights of the people in that particular area, we should step up and we should say, as a country, we are not going to stand for injustice. So I certainly think it will be very interesting to see if uh, retail giants themselves will participate because at the end of the day, this is going to hit on their back pocket. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Panel, what do you think about this in relation to the Gaza conflict? No, let's start with you. You know, I think it's, um, it, it creates some warning signs. But we, we're talking about investments here. Are we are the organisations or the, um, the stakeholders that are involved willing to disinvest from such kind of a mm. situation? 
But the question is, if they don't disinvest, what's going to be happening? Because there's so many other players that are looking and that are, you know, uh, trying to see exactly what happens so that they get into relationship with those kind of organizations. You know, but the thing is, I, I, th I think it, it will be in their best interest to disinvest. Mm, you know what's interesting for me now, uh, Jacob, is the fact that we're still unpacking this issue in terms of what is this Ga Gaza war versus Israel about? We still want the media to tell us what's this all going. What do you think now media should do in terms of now uh, making this part of uh, the retailers, dragging them into the saga, Jacob? Uh, well, the, the, the media can... Um can give us the background of the story and how uh, the retailers can are affected yes are affected and can come in into this uh, into this context but i s don't see that happening why because let's take for example during the apartheid era when uh, there were calls for sanctions against the south african government at that time americans were happy to do business with south, uh, with, uh, south african government the british were very happy to do business with the south african government so when people are hit in the pocket mm. they don't uh, they don't cooperate I don't yeah. see the retailers cooperating there. You know, Alicia, you know what's, what's the most um, heartbreaking issue is that um, we find that there is one group that has got the financial backing, the means and the power to subjugate another grouping. And that really was, was the basis of apartheid. And I think that's where South Africa should come in on, the, on that basis and say, if you as a grouping have got the financial means, you've got the artillery behind uh, you know, stopping uh, these, these particular armies from coming into your area, you should tread very lightly. Mm. And children should not be part of the conflict. And you shouldn't be bombing certain areas. You shouldn't be bombing hospitals. You no, shouldn't don't be bombing. Be, you're going to be here for the whole show. That segment is still coming. And right. I really want to dedicate it to her. But let's move on to our very top story. And of course, you Noah know, mentioned something very, very serious about this. Hijacking cases of two boys dominated the headlines this week. And in one unfortunate case, a boy died and the other was reunited with his family. Let's take a look at this insert compiled by one of our producers, Malibu Homakutli. A heart-wrenching story of the brutal killing of four-year-old Tegra Morris sent shockwaves to the entire nation. We were shocked and horrified by the manner in which our four-year-old Tegra Morris of Riga Park in Johannesburg was dragged under a hijacked runaway car until... He died. <clears throat> no child should be subjected to such brutality. We extend our heartfelt condolences to the Morris family and to the community of Rika Park as a whole. Mother says that she has made peace with the loss of her son but wants the perpetrators to hand themselves over to the authorities. Thank you all. Prayers is what kept me going and still keeping me going. Um, I have made peace on Saturday night when I got the news that my little Tegan is no more. The young boy was laid to rest yesterday. We are now uh, pleased uh, to be joined on the line by Mr. Gareth Newham, Head of Governance, Crime and Justice at the Institute for Security Studies. Mr. Newham, a very good morning to you and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning and thank you for having me. Now, Mr. Newham, it seems that according to research, crime statistics have decreased, but hijack kings are very much still on the rise. Can you please elaborate further for us? Well, in fact, in the most recent official crime statistics uh, were released last year, we saw that most violent crimes, particularly robberies, were on the increase. And this was contributing to an increase in murder and attempted murder as well. So we are quite worried, we were quite worried then, because although the Commission of Police was trying to show that crime had come down over the last five years, in the last two years it has gone up. And when that starts happening, it's very important for the police to warn communities that there's been a shift in crime patterns, and that they must start developing closer partnerships so that we can start getting on top of these situations. Because what happens is, if the crime starts going up, it means more people are starting to commit crimes like hijacking. Uh, you have more inexperienced people with firearms trying to steal cars. And this kind of tragic result with uh, this young tragedy happens. Um, and we, we can't have that happening in South Africa. 
Now, Mr. Newham, what is your organization doing in terms of assisting with this case in particular? Well, we don't. We don't we ask to assist with this specific case. Uh, the police are very well equipped to investigate these kinds of cases, and there's not much we can do to assist them in that. That's an operational matter. What we do is we assess uh, various trends around crime. We do uh, research on people who commit these kinds of crimes. So we've got a program in uh, prisons where we, re we interview and do detailed uh, life histories of repeat violent offenders to understand why people commit violent crimes and how we can prevent it. Um, we also look at uh, trends and patterns across the country to see where these crimes are going up and down and what kind of response we've seen from the police. So that's really what we try and do, and then we try and give this kind of information to the Minister of Police, to Parliament, um, and to the broader community. All right. And very quickly, Mr. Newham, the need to know is about being hijacked. Quick reactions for us, please. If you find yourself uh, being hijacked, there's some uh, one or two people are pointing a firearm at you and you're in your vehicle, the best thing to do is slowly raise your hand and tell the people that are hijacking you that they can take your car um, and that you'll just want them to leave you alone and let you get out unharmed. Make no attempt to try and fight with them, argue them, or show any kind of resistance. It is the only way you can really make sure that you can increase your um, risk of not getting or increase the situation of injured. So really don't try and fight hijackers off. What, if you remember as much as possible, then call the police and tell them what you saw. Mr. Newham, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. That's Mr. Gareth Newham, who's the head of governance, crime and justice at the Institute for Security Studies, giving us an expert view of the seriously growing and worrying trend of fatal and rather violent hijackings with children involved. Now, panel, it's hardly months since the gruesome murders and mutilation of uh, the Deep Sluit children. Um, how has media fed in terms of uh, reporting the story? Let's start with you, Nozin Dombi. Well, I think the media has definitely done a very good job in terms of reporting uh, on the facts on the ground. And I think that uh, we certainly need to give more coverage to, to issues like this because it, it certainly wasn't just Tegren that, that uh, was a victim of a situation like that. I think that the level of, of violent crime in our country is becoming more and more violent and children get caught in the crossfire. So I think the media definitely has a further obligation to make sure that they report even more on a situation like that. Mm -hmm. Jacob? Well, uh, I hope Nozul will agree with me as a practicing journalist herself. But I don't think uh, at, the, at the stage we are at right now, it is simply enough just to report about this. Because this has been going on and on and on and on forever, and the media has been reporting about it. But I don't think it is enough for the media to simply report about it. Why? Because what we are seeing is a failure. Of, of the state, um, of the security uh, apparatus in the country to protect its citizens. The reason for a government anywhere in the world is to protect its citizens. Citizens pay tax so that they can be protected by their government. So when the government is failing to protect its citizens, especially young ones, the media must call them to account for that. Mm. They must be accountable to the people, they must be accountable, and the media must call them to account how are we still failing to protect our young ones? Jacob, my question was, shouldn't media be beating down the judicial system for answers as to why stats say one thing, but the reality is more crime is actually prevalent? Uh, what do you think, Noah? Um, you know, tend to differ slightly you know, from, from, from that aspect, but uh, you know, it takes, say earlier on, it takes such a, a, a horrific incident to create a national outcry. There are so many inst instances that, are, that such crimes happen, um, so many children that get killed in, hij in other hijackings, but they're not covered. People get killed, people get maimed. The question also is, if, if the government has to assist, how can it assist? If, a hijack if say, somebody gets hijacked on your doorstep, where will be the police? It's, it's, not, it's not about the, the, the government to, to play a role there. It's about us as citizens. What are we doing as citizens to keep such instances of crime? Mm, mm. Media should be highlighting the mitigating factors as to why there's so many so, such a rise to hijackings, Nozindom. Well, I certainly do agree with some of, with some of the, the comments that you've made. Um, you know, the media definitely should be the mouthpiece of the people. And yes, we do have an obligation to, to report the issue that's going on. But government policing the state has an obligation to make sure that the people are living in a safe environment. And it's very true what you're saying, that mm. the community should also play a part and we should have further co community policing forums that yes. are working together to ensure that we have a network. But 
it's only going to work if we're all working together mm. that uh, we, 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 we try and make sure that we, we try and minimize crime, we try and make sure that we, we deal with issues like this uh, more effectively. Which brings us to community policing forums and working together as communities. And Listen, and I know that uh, government and also the, 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 um, the, the police will, will alert people as to the hotspots, the hijacking hotspots areas, but you never hardly ever see police in, increased in those hotspots. Why isn't the media probing that, Jacob? It brings me back to my point, my earlier point. The media should, uh, should, uh, should, be, should be obligated to make these people accountable. We are paying taxes here. And these people are being given this money to protect us. And when they fail to do so, the media should call them to account. Yes. Like she said, the media is the mouthpiece of the weak and the powerless in society. So the media should speak on behalf of the people on why does these things keep on happening every day. Mm. Why do they keep on happening? Mm. Because we need to come to a stage where we say, uh, no, this is what used to happen, but we have moved on from this. We've come up with solutions to this kind of problem, but we cannot be keeping on repeating the very same problems over and over and over and over again. But, you know, the question is, at what point does the media then have an obligation to say, we've reported about taking, we've reported about the situation that happened in, 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 in Pretoria. Then what? We've, 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 we've called in the Minister of Policing. You do follow-ups. That's community. hardly what we ever get, no, Zindombe. That's always the problem, that media will always put something in the front pages only when it's hot, only when, it's, when somebody is bleeding or dying, and then it will disappear. We, we never disappear, get any yeah. follow-ups. What happened to the deep slut uh, children that were murdered? What happened to the investigations? We still want to know. So media has that obligation to go out and do those follow-ups, which is what we're not getting, no, Zindombe. Undoubtedly, Alicia, you're quite right in your passionate uh, speech. <laughs> I am. <laughs> you're quite right. Um, and you, you're very right. We certainly do have an obligation. And I do think that there are media houses out there that do make sure they, they have follow-ups. But it may not necessarily be the front page story because, as you know, that the news does move and, you know, the next story will come up. And as and when a situation arises, we cover it to the best of our ability as media. But I certainly don't think that the media should be held responsible and accountable for the situation that's happening on the ground. No, we're, not, we're definitely not holding the media totally accountable. Exactly. We're saying the media should hold people accountable, accountable. For, for, for absolutely promising that, you know what, we're going to govern a certain way or we're going to put certain measures in place to protect its civilians. Isn't that what you were saying there, Jacob? That, that is exactly the point. <laughs> the, other, the other week we were talking about the, the, the kid who fell into a toilet in a pit latrine in, in, in Limpopo. And... That was the last thing we heard about those kind of, of, of latrines. The next thing we'll hear about it knows is when another kid falls into falls that into latrine again. But we're mm. saying the media should be following up on these things to make sure that these things do not happen again. Undoubtedly. And I think that we should be having more discussions with the media. Mm -hmm. We should be having more... Um we should be having more media forums where the media, where issues like that are picked up Absolutely. and issues like that are raised to the forefront because it's not just an issue that deals with the individual media houses. It affects the journalists, it affects the editors. Mm -hmm. And I certainly think that there's always more room for dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to quote something here. It says the annual crime t t statistics rather released by the SA Police Service show a gradual decrease in the number of hijackings over the past five years. However, there seems to be an increase in the, in the violence of hijackings but media hasn't highlighted that aspect in terms of questioning why are we getting exactly. diff very, uh, uh, very varied uh, variations or results in terms of the research. What, does that, who do, what do you believe? Do you believe the statistics or do you believe what is really happening in your backyard? You know, I think that um, it becomes very tricky when it's an issue of statistics because in as much as you may put uh, statistics out there and report on the statistics, it may not necessarily connect with the man on the ground, True. but an issue where it's an individual that has been affected by what was reported in the statistics, that's when people connect and that's when the story grows and it gets bigger. Mm -hmm. So certainly more discussions on it and certainly putting more of a human face on, on statistics. Undoubtedly, there certainly needs to be a certain level of accountability and a certain level of making sure that, uh, <laughs> you know, our public officials are held to account. But... Uh, it, we all need to work in silo. It cannot just be one grouping that 
that takes full responsibility yes, undoubtedly, for everything. Undoubtedly, no, definitely. Undoubtedly. We need to all work together as a nation. Well, we're going to leave it there on that topic. And when we return, we're going to discuss the Marika and a commission of inquiry, as well as the Noomsa wage strike. And Nozin Dombi is smiling. Join the conversation by calling us on plus 2711 7146843, and 7146857. And let us know which stories anywhere you are you feel were not adequately covered by the media. Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor and like our Facebook page. We're back right after this. Don't go anywhere. A very warm welcome to you at home. This is Afro Showbiz News, the show that brings you all things art and entertainment from around the African continent. Tunisian rapper Ben Ahmed, better known as Clay BBJ, has been released after spending two weeks in prison. The arrest came after he was accused of insulting security and violating public morals. The songs sung by the artists criticize the current situation in Tunisia. That's Afro Showbiz. Catch us every Saturday evening at half past seven. Welcome back to Media Monitor. Remember, you can be part of our discussion by calling us and tweeting us. You can ask your questions too via our Twitter account at SA Media Monitor and our panel can hopefully give you some answers. In our next story, our families of the slain miners gain closure about what happened to their loved ones from the testimony of Mr. X where the miners kill preceding the Marikana massacre in 2012. Nozin Dombi is our journalist who's been exclusively covering the Marikana Commission of Inquiry. Nozin Dombi, we've had quite an exciting week in terms of testimonies. Now, please take us through how has it been for you as a journalist covering this commission inside, right inside the commission? Well, it's been very uh, interesting. Um, you know, I wasn't part of the initial um, week where the killings had happened uh, with, with, with the 10 extra people that had died in the preceding days up until the 16th. So it's been interesting to hear from the different people from Lonmin. It's been interesting to hear from the security guards that were there on the day when they heard how their colleagues were killed. It's been very interesting to hear Mr. X's testimony. And it's, it's been extremely heartbreaking to hear the sheer level of brutality that has come out of, of the testimonies from Mr. X. And it just brought back home how desperate this group of 3,000 miners were to get an increase. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't justify the killings that happened, mm -hmm. but for a group of 3,000 men to be that desperate and to feel that the only means that they had to get the increase that they needed was to go about and do ABC. That has been extremely interesting to hear and it's, it's really touched, you know, a part of my soul mm. to hear how, how, how desperate a situation it was for them. Mm. Those in another huge issue here, and I still feel media hasn't, hasn't represented here. Mr. X has been labeled all sorts of names as a witness, uh, a liar, unreliable, etc. Not only by some, uh, some people at the inquiry itself, but by the media in general. Who are we to judge as the media when we're not inside the commission and we don't know what really went on? I mean, the families have accepted what Mr. X has told in the commission. Please elaborate for us. Well, it's very difficult at the moment as a media person to judge Mr. X's mental state, to judge the quality of his, um, of, of, of his testimony, because there are elements of his testimony that are true. Some of what he said is undoubtedly true. It has been proven by postmortems. It's been corroborated by Lonmin security guards. It has been corroborated by some of the other witnesses that have come into the commission. But there's elements of it that, that, that seem very fabricated and very dicey at best. And you remember that we've had three, uh, three un impromptu stops from Mr. X. And he seems to stop when 
he cannot answer and he gets pushed and pushed and pushed and he's backed against a corner and he cannot answer and then he'll give an excuse so and we have a postponement. So it seems evasive in a way. Uh, there's a certain level of evasiveness. So it's very difficult right now to judge. We can't turn around and say that Mr. X's testimony on the main is unreliable because there's definitely elements of truth. Mm. What we can do is, 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 is have a, a wait and see approach to his testimony and wait for Judge Ian Farlam who has heard all the evidence to make a decision as the presiding commissioner and say we will accept Mr. X's testimony or we will not accept his testimony. Mm, mm, all right. Now, panel, why why still hasn't the media, any media picked up on the fact that I think Mr. Dalimpofu said this commission is just a public relations exercise? Why haven't they further picked up on that and investigated what he meant by that? Jacob. Uh, Mr. Dalimpofu also happens to be a political office order for a certain political party. So it's not surprising that he makes those comments. But uh, my understanding of these commissions is that they are given uh, the status of a court. Eh? They exactly. are given the status of a court. So it is, it is unfair to undermine them. Uh, and it is also unfair to prejudge what they are going to say. Because we cannot say it is a peer, a peer exercise when it does not yet come to its conclusion. So I, I would, I would uh, err on the side of the media if they are not really interested in that kind of criticism for the commission. Let the commission do its job. And then after the fact, then you can look at if, it did their, if they did their job correctly or not. So I'm, I'm, uh, let the commission be given their, their, their chance to do what they are uh, entitled to do. Mm. Mm. All right, and that's where we leave it on that topic. I know Nozindombi would like to still continue, but now we're going to move on to our next story. Numsa has vowed to continue with its strike over differences with employers regarding future negotiation conditions, although it has accepted the employer's latest offer. Now, panel, how many weeks have we read Numsa accepts an offer and then the strike is ongoing? When are we going to get the serious reports here about what's really going on? Newsmaker Nozindombi, please tell us. <laughs> well, I think that Numsa is in a very uh, precarious position, considering that uh, AMKU won their fight in such an interesting manner. And I think that they need to show their constituents that they are also going to be standing up for their rights as well. So it's a very interesting uh, situation to see what exactly is going to happen. Are they drawing everything out just so that they can still have that media coverage on them? Or are they legitimately withholding for a better offer? You know, I mean, I don't know. You guys can also yeah. weigh in on that. Uh, but the, the central problem here is that, uh, you know, union leaders... If, if too, too much power but too little influence, right? They create this kind of situation for their followers and they make serious promises and they don't deliver on the promises. Now, when push comes to shove, they, they have to make the whole game as difficult as possible. I think that's basically what it is. It is just a, an issue of um, the leaders not rather failing to deliver and now they don't have reasons as to why they can't deliver to their members. I think that that's why we're having all these problems. And also, their lack of knowledge of the impact of their actions on the economy at large and the people they represent. But Noah, who's not telling the truth here? Is it media, the miners, NUMSA, or the employers? Who's not telling the truth? Um, <laughs> it, it, it could be a little bit of, of, of uh, both the media. I'm sorry about that. And also the, um, the, the, the leaders... Um, because we haven't leaders. heard anything, I'm sorry, we have not heard anything from the miners themselves. And this is what we kept on asking for. Jacob, you're on the show during the AMCO strike. We need to hear what the miners themselves think. What is it that the workers want? We haven't had that angle. It's already three weeks into the strike now. No. Yeah, but, but the gate, the, the gate uh, I don't want to call it oppressed as such. It's about who is supposed to talk to the media. You know, not anybody can talk to the media. It is certain people that can only talk to the media. So the people on the ground cannot. The leaders are the ones that should and that, that must talk to the media. And they're not doing that. The media also is not going to them to push for answers. That is why we're having such problems. Mm. Just to weigh in on that, Noah, I, I know I did cover the Noomsa strike uh, a few weeks back when there was a lull in the Marikana uh, situation. And, um, you know, we did physically go up to a group of um, striking workers mm -hmm. down in, in Isando and uh, down here I, along uh, the industrial area. And it is a very tense situation with them. And you're quite right. 
they are supposed to follow certain protocol and they can't just necessarily speak to the media. And it's not always easy to get in because I know that one of our, on the one day that we went, we were physically threatened by the workers mm. and we, we were chucked out physically thrown out of that particular meeting, impromptu meeting that they'd had. And luckily, if the police were there, had the police not been there, we probably would have been injured or there would have been some violence done against, you know, us as the media people, as media representative. So it's a very difficult situation to balance that, that, that part. Out. I'm very glad that she's here to actually iron out those issues because I, I think a lot of times we tend to overlook the certain challenges, the journalistic uh, challenges that journalists often face in terms of going into you know, areas on, of unrest without any protection whatsoever because it's not like you know overseas where you have that pass to say I'm the media, Be people are just going to shoot guns all around you. You know, you could very well get caught in that crossfire. So I, I think, uh, Nozindomi, thank you for clarifying that to us. But then why don't you ever put that in your reports that we wish we could have delved more into the story, but such challenges is, is, is what we're faced with. At the end of the day, it's not about what the, the, the workers have done to the media. It's about what the workers are looking for. Mm. So it's incidental that we got caught in the crossfire. So that's not the story. The story is that they are looking for a certain amount of money mm -hmm. and whether or not their union is negotiating in good faith with the employer and vice versa. So, you know, it really shouldn't be at that point that the media is could not get access we yeah. want to know why you couldn't have access but we really do want to know don't you think jacob yeah uh, absolutely but then at the same time um i think there is a story that is still untold concerning this uh this um very quickly jacob the, we need to go to a break now <laughs> the norm and uh, the powers that be in norm the way that they do things i don't think they really represent the workers they've got ulterior motives but the media unfortunately for us they never cover the story behind the story. Because mm. this strike that we're seeing is only the tip of the iceberg. Some things are happening behind the scenes. Absolutely. And we need to know what is really happening. Because if it was really about a strike, these things could have been resolved. Thank but you. they go on and on and on and on. Because, they because are we don't things. know the squabbles that are happening in the back. Something for you to probe, News and Dumbi. Well, when we return, we're going to look at the media coverage of the Gaza conflict and the Algerian plane that has gone missing and the aftermath of the MH17 airstrike. You can still be part of our discussion by expressing your views as to which stories you think should have been covered by the media by calling us on plus two seven one one seven one four six eight four three seven one four six eight four seven and seven one four six eight five seven. Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor as well well is on Facebook. Stay with us. This is Media Monitor. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. 99% Zulu has returned to the Lode Theatre in Gold Reef City in Johannesburg this weekend. Now do the Madeba Chai. The Madeba Chai. This guy doesn't know how to do the Madeba Chai. What? Sarah Dupree is bringing his celebrity impersonations to Johannesburg. Audiences will be treated to nights of glitz and glamour and sure Lady Gaga, Tina Turner and more impersonations. That's Afro Showbiz News, Saturdays, 7.30pm on SABC News. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. Welcome back to Media Monitor and you can still be part of our discussion by calling us on the numbers that will appear at the bottom of your screens shortly or contact us on Facebook as well as on Twitter. Kolani from Kempton Park, a very good morning to you. Thank you for staying on the line. Your comment, please. Yes, good morning, Alicia. A very good morning, Kolani. Please go ahead. Uh, same as that to the panel. Uh, good morning, uh, I would like to comment on the issue of norm, sir. Please go ahead. With uh, yes, which uh, the panel has been stating that uh, maybe NUMSA, the leadership of the organization, they are doing what they are doing in order to compare themselves with the strike of uh, loan me. It is not true. NUMSA it is negotiating in good faith, in good faith and honesty uh, for their uh, for their members. The only the problem which we are facing as this organization and the members of this organization is the employers whom are not negotiating in a good faith at all. CIFSA is the really problem in 
throughout all these negotiations. Tunisia is always available to talk to FIFA. No, FIFA is not available at times. Now, as as Munsa has stated, that is is accepting the offer, but there are some other conditions which are emanating from the main agreement which we are using in this industry. Your Section 37 and labor broking, FIFA wants to take away all those benefits of the workers, which we have achieved those benefits long time ago. So that is the real problem which we are facing with FIFA. All right. Polanyi, I take it you're a member of NUMSA, and as you've just rightly pointed out, you think that the problem is not absolutely the leadership of NUMSA, but rather the employers that are not sitting down with you to negotiate properly. Exactly. Now, Polanyi, hasn't anybody in, in, in NUMSA like, decided to contact the media and raise uh, this issue with the media? No, there's a protocol of uh, Alicia. Alicia, uh, there's a protocol in NUMSA which members of NUMSA, they don't want to hear anything from media without coming to the members first. Mm. That is the real protocol of NUMSA. That is why leadership of NUMSA doesn't rush and run to the media most of the time. All right. Okay, Golani, thank you so much uh, for your comments uh, this morning. Nuzin do you want to comment on that quickly? Well, I think it's a very interesting uh, perspective. Mm. He sounds like a very passionate NUMSA member. And I think um, his, his, his passion reflects the sheer desperation of the people to get this increase. Mm. And I think that should be the issue. The issue should be what is the employer and NUMSA doing to resolve the strike? Mm. Mm, mm. Thank you so much. There, we're going to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Kolani, for your views on the show this morning. Now, to our next story. According to UN statistics, about 100,000 Palestinians have been displaced in UN schools. Others found refuge with relatives, occupied shops in the inner city of Gaza. Now, this comes after the Israeli army continues to fire rockets. Media Monitor producer Livin Mklade compiled this report. Let's take a look. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemned the attacks and calls on for ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. President Jacob Zuma also urged Egyptians to welcome victims with open arms. South Africa joins the United Nations Secretary General Mr. Ban Ki-moon in calling for an immediate ceasefire by all sides and a resumption of the flow of humanitarian aid to the suffering people of Gaza. We appeal to the Egyptian authorities to open their doors to the injured and affected people of Gaza. Opposition party Democratic Alliance parliamentary leader Musi Maimwan says their party is disturbed by the ongoing conflict. We're concerned that what is happening in Gaza today cannot be considered by any reasonable person to be a commensurate response. And we hope that the parties to the conflict will lead the unanimous international call for humanitarian ceasefire. Meanwhile, in South Africa, several civil society organizations, political parties, human rights organizations, and trade unions are hosting over 20 major protest actions which commenced on Friday. All right, before we delve further into that story, William from Ottawa Zimbabwe, very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on Media Monitor. Uh, good morning, how are you? We're very well, thank you, William. Please go ahead with your comment, sir. Man, I'd just like to comment on... The, can, can you read me? Yes, we can hear you. I just want to... William Kalatshila from Tabazimbi. I just want to comment on the, the, the... There was a story I think I read on... which I believe the, the media should have covered on, on, on one of the newspapers last year by a private owner who was, who was murdered after after taking photos of the police in his cousin and then made after after two weeks after exposing those police uh, that, that that particular time owner was murdered and then even the issue of 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 of, 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 of the, the murder of the family, those police were not found guilty and i think the media did not even bother to make some follow-ups the media only made noise when uh, I mean, issue like the um, Green Morris, uh, 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 the, the, the issue of Tigrin Morris has happened, and then from there the whole media is just silent. I, I believe 
in my opinion, or media should make some follow-ups on issues like, I believe the the issue of the, 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 the children of uh, the wife of Afatani, to lay the issue to rest, the media should make some follow-ups on, on people should be held accountable. Those people who killed Afatani should be held accountable. And that particular travel owner, who should, I mean, who, who exposed the police, those are some of the things that the media should expose and, and follow up so that the, 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 to know that the police brutality can stop. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, William from Etaba Zimbi. No, don't be smiling next to me because I'm glad it comes from a civilian, a citizen who thinks that the media does not do follow ups. Can you promise us some follow ups on your stories? Well, we can certainly <laughs> promise, William, that as the media, we will endeavor to continue doing further follow-ups. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, William, for your comment there. Now, panel, let's let's delve into Gaza. In all fairness, has the media been impartial when reporting about this? It seems to me that everybody is weighing very heavily on Israel in terms of the, the fact that they're bombing Gaza, whereas Gaza has not uh, accepted any ceasefires by everybody and also not accepted any major ceasefire deals um, that were brokered by all the other uh, countries. Jacob, let's start with you. Uh, I'll start by saying this this... The Gaza story is a very dangerous one uh, for for everyone who is concerned, even those who are reporting on it, because there's also danger of being called an anti-Semite if you if you are too much on the side of the people of Gaza, and also if you are too much on the side of the people of Israel, you are also considered to be denying the genocide and the war crimes that are taking place in Gaza. But I think um, if you look at the media, Western media as compared to African media, there's a clear dichotomy in the way that they are reporting. The Western media is very much uh, reporting from the side and the perspective of Israel. And the African media, especially the South African media because of the, of the history of South Africa, is also reporting from the side of the people of Gaza. Mm. So I think it is only through uh, a cross-section of the, of the different types of media that you can see a balanced view, but not, not really in the sense of, of one media reporting it uh, in a balanced way. I, I wouldn't say, I would say no. You, you, you actually see a, a bit of hypocrisy in the media when mm. it comes to the coverage of Gaza. Uh, because if, if you look at the Western media, for example, the way that they look at the casualties in Gaza, they would say, today 100 people have been killed uh, in this area. If they were covering Syria, they were saying 3,000 people have been killed so far in this, uh, in this conflict. So the way that they are reporting uh, is meant to, to show Israel as being uh, as restraining itself in, 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 in responding to the, mm. to the rockets that are being fired from Gaza. On the other hand, you have the other media that, that uh, continuously up on the fact that the people of Gaza are sending rockets into Israel mm. Mm. without... Um, without looking at, at the responsibilities of both sides in this conflict, because the conflict is not caused by just one side of the, of, of, of the two, but both sides are responsible for the conflict and both sides should be held to account for, for their actions. All uh, right, Jacob, unfortunately, we've run out of time on that topic. I'm so sorry, panel. Stay tuned, because when we return, we're going to be discussing the coverage of the Boko Haram saga. You can still call us on plus 2711-714-6847, Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor, as well as on Facebook. Don't go anywhere. We'll return shortly after this. ABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. The Swiss government appears to be loosening its grip on the diamond trade. A new gazette is making provisions for private companies to cut, polish and even sell diamonds internationally. Companies will have to apply for permission from the state to sell the gems. There is now less smuggling of the diamonds themselves, but the issue we now have is transfer pricing. But civil society groups remain concerned about the illicit trade. Industry watchdogs say more transparency is needed in the country's diamond trade. Your world, weekdays between 11 and 12 midnight. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration.
Welcome back. You can also be part of our discussion by contacting us on the numbers that will appear at the bottom of your screens. Not forgetting Twitter as well as Facebook also as a medium for you to ask your questions. If you can't call in, we are waiting for your views. What are you waiting for? In our next story, Bomb Blast is one of the latest terrorist actions of Boko Haram against the Nigerian government. And yet it has been more than 100 days since the schoolgirls of Shibak have gone missing. Let's take a look at this clip. Girls spoke uh, in great detail about their experience and what they went through and their observations. Yes, it was an open and frank, you know, uh, session in which everybody was encouraged to say their mind. Government will place uh, these young ladies in uh, other schools. Government will rebuild uh, the Chibok, uh, the government secondary school in Chibok and other affected institutions, and that uh, the girls should not have any fears about their future. Now, I think almost everyone in the country, in fact, everywhere in the other states, they are aware or have heard of Boko Haram. People are scared. They live among us. But media has not uh, result, resorted into reporting or digging deeper into who are these people. Nozindombi. Well, I think it goes back to the issue of the safety of the media versus the need to know. Boko Haram has uh, branded themselves as a very uh, militant little terrorist group, and they have decided that they're not necessarily going to be open to either the media or to government uh, intervention or, or, or any of that. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to cover a situation like that where the newsmaker is, is, is difficult to break into. But I do think that the media should play a, a deeper role in trying to get in there and trying to, to try and get a scoop at the end of the day. I mean, whoever does get the scoop with Boko Haram will certainly have a made career. So mm. that, 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 you know, the media does have a role in terms of making sure that they try as much and get all sides of the story. Mm. Mm. Noah? I, I think... I give you some beautiful exoneration there. Yeah. <laughs> with with, with, with uh, Boko Haram, uh, I think the blame should be on the Nigerian government. They need to use their own intelligence to establish where these people are based. Mm -hmm. What we know is they're actually in the northern um, um, uh, areas of Nigeria or in the villages of Nigeria. Why then would the government not use it, its intelligence agencies to probe and see where exactly they are and get them? So it's not an issue about the media in this regard. I think it is the Nigerian government that needs to put all its resources to, uh, um, to use and, and, and establish where these people are and arraign them. No, actually, I wanted to say most reports are now painting good luck Jonathan as a stubborn beast because of his slow reaction to the saga in Nigeria. And it, because Nigeria is now in tatters, do you get the feeling that media is implying that Jonathan knows exactly who and what Boko Haram is and is just not letting go yeah, of that information? That, that's correct. Um, latest reports uh, indicate that the, um, most of his generals actually aid Boko Haram. So they should be more than miss the eye. Something really has to be done. Jonathan should be maybe part of the whole thing because he is moving very slowly. I don't know whether he's moving at all, mm. but from what we what we see, what we are hearing, he's moving in the, quite slowly for a person that's leading a country that is in, in such a crisis. Mm, mm, mm. Jacob, very quickly. I, I think Nazul, they help me here. Who is Boko Haram? Do you, do you guys, as part of the media, not even know who they are? What are they fighting for? Yes, they might be terrorists. But what are they fighting for? Who are they? Because every terrorist group has got uh, a, a, an aim, what they want to achieve. Mm. And I've never seen anywhere in the media where that has been interrogated. What are they fighting for? And but, you know, it becomes very difficult when you hear reports of over 200 young girls being abducted by this group called mm -hmm. Boko Haram that acts in cloaks and daggers and shadows. Do we really want to know who Boko Haram is at this, at this moment? All right, Pano. Yes, yes, yes. You can wrap on that. <laughs> I, think we, I think we really do want to know because I think there's also been a lot of allegations in terms of the army personnel has been implicated, as, you, as, as Noah rightfully pointed out, but no media is probing further into that because apparently these people have ammunition, they have uniforms, they have cars that look exactly like the military ones. So maybe journalists need to dig further yes, into one, that. Oh, all right, panel, <laughs> that's where we leave it. I have to read tweets now, unfortunately. Um, let's take some of your 
your tweets that some of you have sent us today in regards to some of the hot topics that we've been discussing today. Uh, let's see if we have those tweets on Bright Eye. Do we have them? All right, I'll read them off uh, my page here. Okay, there we go. Um, our first tweet says, uh, from TK Malela, says, The sadness of all this is the inhumane mentality that goes with it when people don't even have the decency to leave the kid. Mm, mm, thank you so much, TK Malela. That is in relation to uh, the Teguin Mori story. Helene Lupacini says, Sign of the time, the world is ruled by evil and darkness. Don't even think the death penalty would have an effect. Thank you so much, Helene, for your comment there. Osman Musangema, I don't even know who's taking Mr. X seriously because his testimony doesn't make sense at all. All right, thank you so much, uh, Osman Ngema there. Kaipin Gauteng says, Unions don't mind if their people die of hunger or if the South African economy fails. Selfish bastards. Wow. All right, that's Kaipi in Gauteng. Dirk Jones says, It's time the unions were held to account for violence, intimidation, and the damage to property. New culture. Thank you so much, Dirk Jones. West Coast FM says, Yes, when the superpowers stop sponsoring the war, it's now about ammunition sales, not about conflict. Very interesting view there. Thank you so much, West Coast FM. Thank you for your uh, comments there. And bring back our girls, last but not least, African states should unite and deal with Boko Haram harshly and send a strong message to terrorists. Thank you so much to all our viewers, our lawyer viewers, for your commentary there. Panel, very quickly, very quickly, 10 seconds each. Your leading stories this week. What do you think will be in the, in the news this week, Jacob? Uh, Gaza. Gaza. Because uh, apparently the, the ceasefire has been lifted as well. Mm -hmm. So there will be more shelling, more killings and more bloodshed. So I expect that. In fact, that Gaza has started uh, shelling this morning yes, already. Yes, All right, so very quickly. No, one Gaza word. Gaza was on my mind and uh, <laughs> we, we, we need a lot of follow-ups you know, on what's happening uh, on Gaza. I think we might actually be having some of those in the week that's mm. coming. No, so don't be, what can we expect? To speak locally, I think two stories, the Marikan Commission and definitely the Lumsa Strike. All those right. are the two stories. All right, and of course, for all the Marikana Commission and all other related news, Nozin Dombi and our other uh, journalists are always out there getting the news as they happen, and she did say that they promised to do uh, some follow-ups on those stories. Well, that is where we leave it today. Thank you so much, panel, for your insightful views this morning, and our viewers' contributions and suggestions is highly valued. Remember, you can email us your views about the show at mediamonitor.sabc.co.za Share your views and comments on Facebook. Go to www.facebook.com dot com forward slash media monitor and like our page you can also follow us on twitter at sa media monitor thank you so much for watching media monitor join us again next week right here on sabc news it's all local all global and all the time and just in case you missed our live show you can catch the repeat on monday morning at 2 a.m for myself alicia jolly and the rest of the qtf team have yourself a blessed sunday goodbye ABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. It's impossible for a person to walk in his destiny, his full destiny, without receiving Jesus. When we are born, we embark on a, a journey, and that journey is to find God. Fantua de Yaga's journey from a troubled little boy to the pastor of a dynamic young evangelistic crusade called Salvation 10 began at an early age. I can remember when I was a very little boy, my father was an alcoholic and my mother had an affair with another man. I got so confused, I was left empty. Because of that split up with my, my parents, this emptiness just got bigger and bigger and I, I became more aware of this emptiness in my heart. Francois's misguided attempt to fill the void in his life was to start smoking. He was only seven years old. If I start smoking, that will sort out that emptiness and that search in my life. And then by the age of 13 or maybe going on to 14, I was addicted to alcohol. I, I was an alcoholic. I also got expelled from school because uh, of alcohol and drugs. To make a very long story short, I ended up on the street because nobody ever wanted me. 
Nobody, because I turned out to be this washout in their eyes. Francois ended up staying with his father, who himself was staying with some friends. Francois continued in his drinking ways, and it all ended badly one night. I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. Um, people afterwards, after the whole event, told me I ran around and wanted to grab the children and say, I'm Lucifer, I want the children. I really wanted to, to be violent against my father. And the person whose home it was, uh, he came to me and said, Francois, we, I don't agree with this behavior. I give you 10 minutes and then you pack your bags and you're out of my house. I turn around and I went to the kitchen and I got two steak knives and I really wanted to kill this man. He phoned the police and uh, about 10 or 15 minutes after that, they, the police were there and um, I went to jail for attempted murder. But miraculously, I don't, like many parts of my life, I don't know how it works, but miraculously, I got released uh, without any charges or, or anything. And once again, I landed up on the street. I started really to, to, to go into more drugs and more alcohol. I was just sleeping on the street. And there was this particular couple, a young married couple, and uh, somehow they, they heard about me and they had compassion on me. And I believe that's, that's the Holy Spirit. And they said to me, Francois, we will give you a place to stay. We will take you from the street on one condition. You must go for a rehabilitation course. Francois' resolve didn't last too long. He was back to his old ways. When he got home one night from drinking, the couple were waiting for him. They just looked at me with tears in their eyes. Obviously, I, I was too drunk to, to feel sorry. I said, well, this is the way of life. And they decided that they will invite me to go to church with them the next Sunday. I had absolutely no desire to go to church. I didn't know what to expect. I was very, very nervous. I knew nothing about Christianity. As I was sitting there, they started praise and worship. And then the preacher came on the pulpit, but he didn't preach. He was just standing there with a the mic in his hand and closed his eyes and with one of his hands in the air. I was confused. All of a sudden, in this very quiet atmosphere, the youth started to jump up with flags and they started running around and people started singing spontaneously, praising God and worshiping God. What happened next changed Francois' life forever. All of a sudden, I was cut off from any, all that activity around me and this invisible force was with me. But I could hear it in my heart and in my mind. I could hear a voice saying to me, Francois, my name is Jesus. I love you. I died for you on the cross. If you leave this church building today without making a decision for me, you don't have long to live. And you're on your way to hell. In three seconds that morning, Jesus did for me what no person could do for me in three years, that no drugs could do for for me in the seven or eight years that I used it. It was truly a miracle. Over the next two years, Francois would study theology and become a youth pastor. Along the way, he met and married his wife, Armandi, but he felt a need inside, a passion that wouldn't sleep. There's one particular night we couldn't sleep, Armandi and myself, and I said, well, let's go and pray. And I can remember we prayed for an hour, and, but it felt if I was praying against the ceiling. I got so frustrated and I said that to the Lord in my prayer. I can remember I, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit was in that room and I felt in my heart the Holy Spirit said to me, where are those evangelists that will bring in the harvest of young people of this generation? And that's when we started Salvation to Every Nation, focusing on youth evangelism. Our main thrust is what we call uh, Reload Youth Conferences. It's a big mass crusade focused on young people. And the reason we call it Reload is because this generation of young people is empty and they need to be reloaded. Not with any, any junk. They need to be reloaded with the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. We try to go indoors to make it more youth friendly. Many churches struggle with how can we get